this is joint work with uh, Joris Waters from the National Bank. Now, I think I don't have to tell you that uh, energy prices have increased a lot recently uh, since last year. And in fact, in Belgium, even much more than in other European countries. And that has launched uh, a debate on what are the distributional consequences, what are the macroeconomic consequences, how do we have to stabilize these consequences, uh, how should income support policies be organized, and so on. Now, to answer all these questions, it's crucial to know how households actually respond to energy price shocks. And this is actually a question more generally if you think in terms of climate change policies um, and so on um, as well. And this is what we actually um, do in this paper. So we study a, a number of novel features of the household's price elasticity of energy demand on the one hand, and on the other hand, the marginal propensity to consume after paying a more expensive or cheaper uh, energy bill depending on, on the, the, the direction of the, of the price change. Why are these two uh, parameters uh, very important? Well, on the one hand, of course, the price elasticity of energy demand is crucial to measure by how much uh, people will react in terms of energy consumption when prices change. And that, of course, also matters uh, to know uh, how much is left uh, of the effect after uh, paying the energy uh, bill. So what is the impact on disposable income uh, after paying the bill? In addition, the price elasticity of energy demand is also crucial to determine the magnitude of the impact of supply shocks. So, if, for instance, if your uh, price elasticity is very low, that means that supply shocks will have big effects, will lead to big increases, for instance, in energy prices when there's a negative supply shock. And then, of course, the marginal propensity to consume determines then, in, an, in turn, how households or the type of expend, spending responds to fluctuations in energy prices. And that's, of course, important if you want to learn more about uh, macroeconomic consequences and uh, how you have to design uh, stabilization policies. Now, what is the methodology that we use uh, in this paper? It was already mentioned a bit in uh, Michael his uh, discussion. So what we will use in this paper is we use um, survey questions about spending in hypothetical scenarios. Uh, this has, a has been a popular tool um, to estimate marginal propensity to consume out of unexpected uh, one-time, so temporary uh, income shocks. That literature, I mean, there are also papers that have shown that these results are quite reliable and quite similar to actual uh, estimates based on actual data. And of course, the advantage of a survey environment is that you do not have to uh, make sometimes strong assumptions, statistical assumptions to identify exogenous shocks uh, and so on. And as we will also demonstrate, the survey environment gives you a lot of possibilities to do some extras, which is very difficult to do with actual data. So we are, in fact, now the first that use that approach to estimate the price elasticity of energy demand. And on the other hand, the marginal propensity to consume after paying uh, the energy bill. So since uh, energy prices typically follow a random walk, this MPC uh, should more be considered as a response to a more anticipated but permanent uh, or highly persistent income shock, um, at least in contrast to all these others that mainly focus on temporary shocks. Now, what we will do in our uh, environment, we will be able to distinguish between the extensive and intensive margins. Uh, do people react? And if they react, how much do they react? And then we will explore nonlinearities as well and heterogeneity across uh, households. And these are all kind of dimensions that have not been explored a lot uh, for these type of questions that we, uh, that we have here. Now, how do we organize it? What is the methodology? Well, the National Bank, um, in collaboration with the European Commission, organizes a monthly uh, consumer survey. Uh, this survey is used to construct confidence indicators, uh, consumer confidence, um, inflation expectations, uh, and so on. So that's done every month for a representative and uh, renewed sample of about 1,850 uh, households. They are interviewed via uh, telephone. And then they typically get the standard set of questions uh, about their characteristics. They have collect some characteristics of the household, the financial situation of the households, what do they uh, plan in terms of uh, purchases, what are their expectations about the economy, and so on. And then we had the opportunity during the months of May, June, and July to add extra questions at the end of the survey about spending and hypothetical energy price shock scenarios. And I will explain you these questions uh, later. But we will use um, the standard questions 
uh, to explore heterogeneity. Yeah, so we will use these questions, and based on these questions, we construct a number of uh, measures, a number of characteristics that might matter for the MPC and the uh, price elasticity. So a lot of these questions are typically qualitative. Uh, it's like, do you expect growth to be much better than last year, better, worse, or equal, worse, much worse? So we have transformed these qualitative answers into a quantitative indicator and then standardized. So by saying, okay, it's a plus two, it's like a balanced statistics, plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two. So that's the way we have done this. Um, what are the typical kind of characteristics? Well, the most used are like cash on hand, which is income of the household. So we have information about that, their income category. On the other hand, typically people look at wealth. Well, unfortunately, that is not a question included in the survey, but we have some questions that are related to saving. So the, one of the questions asks, um, today, are you able to save a lot, a little, not at all? Do you have to dissave or do you have to borrow to, uh, to consume? And also, what do you plan for the coming year? Are you planning to save a lot or not? So we use these questions to, um, to, capture, to, to construct a measure which is capturing, do you have a saving bu a buffer to adjust your, 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 your saving in order to consume or not? Then we have macroeconomic expectations, which is uh, expectations of economic uh, activity by the households. Then we have a, a new measure, which is um, financial uncertainty. So the household is also asked, how certain are you about your financial situation uh, in the future? Are you very certain or uncertain or not, and so on. Uh, then we construct some indicators based on intended consumption. So those households are also asked, uh, do you plan to consume more durables compared to last year, much more or not, or less or much less? And then also one of the questions that will be uh, useful is, um, how likely do, will you engage in major home improvements or renovations? Uh, do you intend to spend large sum to renovate uh, your house? Then we have the traditional kind of characteristics, family size, gender, and age that we will include to explore heterogeneity. So the first question is very simple. We ask how much uh, are your monthly expenses for electricity and heating at the moment? So we only have these two components. We don't look at, for instance, uh, uh, petrol. So it's electricity and heating. And then they answer, they give the amount. So the median is 170 euro per month. The mean is uh, 202 euro per month. We see no difference between these, um, these three months. And then we ask uh, the household, well, we ask a question, well, suppose now, so we, we, we know how much they pay, that at constant consumption, your monthly energy bill would increase by X euro due to an increase in energy prices. What would you do? And then we have a random treatment which is different across uh, families. So we have a treatment of respectively 20 euro increase, a 50 euro increase, a 100 euro increase, and a decrease by 50 euro. So we will explore these different treatments uh, to see whether there are non-linearities non depending on the sign of the shock and depending on the magnitude of the shock. And then we ask them, okay, so assume that your um, invoice increases by, let's say, 50 euro. Would you consume less, more, of a, or as much energy compared to the situation without the price change? And then if they say less or more, then we ask how much euro, more or less, uh, of energy would you consume less or more each month if your energy bill at constant prices would change by that, that amount? Now, based on these answers, uh, we can uh, calculate the underlying price elasticity of energy demand. And so based on the change in the bill, and we know how much they pay, we have the price shift, and then based on their response, we can calculate an underlying quantity um, shift, and then by taking the ratio of these two, we have the implicit price elasticity of energy demand of these uh, households. And then we continue and we ask, okay, would you make uh, less, more, or as many other expenses, non-energy expenses? And then if they say less more, we ask how much? And then the same question, would you save less more equally or maybe possibly tack into your savings? Again, they provide the answer. And based on these two, we don't, know, don't have to know the, the change in disposable income, but based on the change in saving and the change in, in, in uh, consumption, well, based on these two, we can calculate the marginal propensity to consume after paying uh, the energy bill of the household at, or at least the intended marginal propensity to consume. So what do these different scenarios first learn of? So what about the price elasticity and the scenario? Now, on average, the price elasticity actually turns out to be very similar to those that are based on actual data that are reported in, in meta studies. So, so, so from that point of view, also these estimates are more or less 
realistic, let's put it that way. Now we see first um, that there's a big difference uh, between increases and decreases. So here you see, depending on the scenario, what is the underlying price elasticity of all the households. And then you see when, for instance, the bill increases by 50 euro, we see an elasticity of minus 0.27. However, when there is a decrease in price, we see an elasticity of 0.08. So it's three times stronger elasticity of price increases. Now, this is a finding which is also has been documented in the macro literature. And that can be explained, for instance, when prices increase, uh, people will take measures to reduce energy consumption. Solar panels or, or insulation of the house, of course, which are irreversible. Once prices decrease, you keep on consuming less energy, which is, in fact, good news because prices are increasing a lot now. Well, when they would normalize, normalize then that means that we will um, use, consume uh, less energy on a permanent basis. Now, the less good news is that this elasticity tends to decrease with larger price shifts. And so when you have an increase of 20 euros, 0.48, and it's only half of that when you have an increase uh, of your bill by 100 uh, euro. So that means that the price elasticity tends to weaken for larger price shifts. And of course, today, that means that the more prices are increasing or haven't increased recently, the less that people can react by adjusting their consumption. So the elasticity tends to decrease. So that means that supply shocks get bigger effect uh, on energy prices. Now, why do we find this? Well, it appears that, for instance, when we increase this, the magnitude of the price shock, then more households uh, decide to reduce um, energy consumption. Also, the magnitude uh, um, in terms of percentage, they also uh, react more, but this is much less than proportional than the change in the price shift. Uh, for instance, when you have an increase of 20 euro of the bill, um, I think it's 49% uh, of the households, they say that they will reduce consumption. When we increase it to 100, it's 56%. But that's less than proportional because the price shock is about five times as, as strong. What about um, heterogeneity? Well, we do not find a lot of heterogeneity across households, so the elasticity does not depend on income, saving buffer, macro expectations, so it's not that high income or low income react, have to react more or do react more than high income. That's not, uh, seems to be the case. We only uh, find uh, uh, greater price elasticity for those households that will likely undertake major home improvements or renovations over the next 12 months. So it seems that for these households, the transaction cost to take extra measures seems to be lower, and they report that they would reduce their consumption even more than they would do uh, otherwise. So that's one thing. And then on the other hand, we also find a weaker elasticity for families with what we call more appetite to consume or more consumer confidence that does, are those that indicate that they will increase their uh, purchases of durable goods uh, in the coming year. For price decreases, we do not find any um, differences across the different types of uh, households that we have here. Now, what about the MPC um, after, uh, after paying um, the energy bill? Now, on average, we find an MPC of 0.52. That's a bit lower than, that's much lower than what Michael finds in another study for gasoline prices in the US. Based on transaction data, you find uh, MPC, which is close to one. Our is below one, it's 0.52, but that's much higher than those that are reported for temporary income shocks. And so that uh, are shown in, in that literature. Um, we do not find uh, a lot of differences depending on the magnitude of the price shift. Um, it's a bit higher for, for 20 euro compared to increases of 100 euro, but statistically that's not uh, highly significant. We do find, however, a strong difference between price increases and decreases. So a price increase, which is a reduction of disposable income, tends to have a higher MPC, which is 0.6. And when you have a decrease of prices, that means that you have a, a, your, your disposable income increases. Well, then you have a, an MPC, which is only 0.4. And so we, we confirm that asymmetry of um, yeah, these other studies for temporary income shocks. Now, what, here we find much more heterogeneity across households. So, so for price increases, uh, we find that uh, MPCs are, cons are significantly higher uh, for low-income households and households with lower saving buffer. Uh, so that's consistent, again, with that literature that talks about uh, liquidity constraints, uh, cash on hand um, influence for temporary income shocks. So we confirm that uh, kind of finding. 
Uh, we, in addition to that, we have uh, two new uh, measures that, that seems to be significant and explain heterogeneity across households. So we find higher MPCs for households that are more uncertain about their financial situation yeah, after controlling. So we, what we actually do is we, we estimate uh, the MPC on all these characteristics simultaneously. So we are controlling implicitly for the other characteristics. A bit later uh, in the final slide, I will show you the economic relevance of this difference of the characteristics by lo looking at some type of households. And we find lower MPCs for households that have more appetite to consume. So that have more appetite, that have, are more confident co to consume, while they reduce their consumption uh, less than the other households uh, in the sample. Perfect. In addition to that, we find higher MPC for female household heads. Uh, that's also something that has been documented in, in, in uh, some other studies. Um, some argue that this might be explained by uh, having, uh, on average, lower income. So that's also somehow capturing a bit of an income effect. And then all the other characteristics turn out to be insignificant. Uh, so the macro expectations, the age or the family size. What about price decreases? Well, where here we find other characteristics that matter. Uh, we find significantly higher MPCs for households that have a lower saving buffer. So this liquidity constrained households, they react also much more um, to um, negative shocks in income. So, so to, to, to price decreases, which are positive shocks to disposable income, sorry. And we also find that the MPC increases with age, uh, which also makes sense if you have a, a permanent, if you have an increase of your income, uh, when you are younger, you have more incentive to save for the future, so your horizon becomes shorter uh, when you're older, so your MPC uh, increases, so you consume much more uh, the benefit that you have. And the other characteristics turn out to be um, insignificant. Now, what about uh, the economic relevance and the policy implications of this uh, heterogeneity that we have um, documented for the MPC? Well, the way that we evaluate that, um, we look at the effectiveness of two policy measures implemented by the Belgian government in response to the uh, energy price crisis. So on the one hand, in Belgium, you have a, so a targeted so-called social tariff. Uh, these are uh, targeted uh, towards, let's say, the 10% lowest income uh, categories in Belgium. And uh, the government has extended that tariff uh, to the 20%, more or less, lowest uh, income households uh, from May 21 uh, onwards. And that tariff, in a sense, uh, means that this price, the price increase for these households is much less than the other households. For instance, the social tariff in, uh, to, uh, over the previous year has increased for gas and electricity about 20%, whereas commercial tariffs have increased by more than 100%. So these households did not experience the price increase. So you can, we can evaluate that uh, by looking at how would they have reacted in case the price would have increased uh, during um, that, that year. And that's the way we are going to look at their MPC. Uh, because otherwise, uh, that means that the invoice would be much more expensive uh, without that measure. On the other hand, uh, the Belgian government decided to do a general VAT reduction on gas and electricity. Uh, they have reduced the electricity for all households from 21 to 6 percent. And that was around the same time of, of the survey. Uh, so the survey was in, 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 May, uh, uh, in May and June and July. And this change in VAT, that was in, in April. Uh, so more or less, the answer that they provide to the question, what would you do when your energy prices would decrease, corresponds to uh, what would you do when the VAT, there is a VAT reduction uh, given as a starting point. Um, and then we construct four household uh, profiles to evaluate the economic relevance uh, of the heterogeneity uh, and both policy measures. So we have three types of households that overlap a lot with that social tariff. Uh, so we have uh, constructed um, a low cash on hand uh, type of profile, households with low income and low saving buffer. Among those, you also have those that on top of that are very uh, uncertain about their financial situation. And then we have a, a, what we call a single mom in financial distress because that's the category that turns out to have the highest MPC uh, when prices increase. So we have these three, uh, let's say, rather fragile uh, households uh, that got targeted with uh, social tariff. And then we have a fourth uh, profile, which are high cash on hand and saving buffer. Um, and they have also their future financial, 
finances uh, easy that are easy to predict. So we look at these four types of households, and then we check, okay, what is their uh, marginal propensity to consume, and um, yeah, how are they compared to each other? Well, as you could see here, that uh, the MPC, given our results, is much higher for those, um, those households that over here. So you have these um, that are targeted by the social tariff. Well, they have a very high marginal propensity to consume. And they have up to uh, 0.7 or 0.8 uh, MPC. So these measures seem to be very effective. It seems to be very effective because otherwise, if prices would have increased for these households, um, then they would have reduced their consumption a lot, yeah, quite a lot. And then when you look at the VAT reduction, which is the price decrease, then you see that actually the MPCs for all these type of households are much lower, but particularly those of the high income households. Yeah, so the high income households are actually those that benefit most from the VAT reduction because they have higher energy uh, invoices on average uh, to start with, and they have an MPC which is actually uh, 0.27. Yeah, so if you look at the efficiency of these government measures, so if you spend one euro and you target it to these low-income households, which is done by the social tariff, well, 0.8 returns on the economy uh, via more consumption. Well, if you do VAT reduction, well, the bulk of the benefit is actually saved. Ends up on saving accounts, especially for those uh, high-income uh, households that we have here. Okay, so let me then uh, briefly uh, conclude. So we find that um, the price elasticity of energy demand is greater for price increases compared to price decreases but tends to weaken for larger price increases. Uh, we cannot really explain that, uh, this difference across households by standard um, characteristics. Uh, for price increases, the price elasticity uh, does seem to be greater for households that will likely undertake major home renovations and smaller for families with more appetite to consume. On the other hand, the NPCs are larger for price increases than price decreases, so we also have an asymmetry here, a slightly lower for larger price shocks, but not really significant. And these NPCs depend on income, saving both for financial uncertainty and appetite to consume for price increases, for price decreases. It's more for uh, households with a greater saving buffer, we find a larger NPC and younger families. Finally, targeted price subsidies seems to be much more effective in supporting non-energy consumption than the general uh, VAT reductions that the government has implemented. Thank you.